we were being deliberate about oriental as that derogatory term, but also thinking about that bitterness around, um, you know, why are we, why are some Asian actors only thing on, or demanding recognition of of Asian racism is separated from anti-indigenous and anti-black racism how do we actually organize more intersectionally and in in solidarity so that's a little my very 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 long extent no it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's you know I'm sorry to uh, to link all those ideas together but but I was fascinated and loved the uh, the opening page of the website. I think that was an impressive explanation. Expanding on those three ideas, questions about your activism. I'm curious how your work and your research has changed you. Mm. I, you know, I didn't set out to be an artist. <laughs> In fact, I think it's a, I should mention, you know, even though I've been a filmmaker since I was 14, that never was something that I considered myself. I, I don't really know. I, I mean, actually, I do know. I mean, there's a lot of neoliberal pressures to find a profession, you know, for example, right? In yeah. arts, there's a lot of misunderstandings of what an artist is, I think. I'll tell, I'll tell a quick story. When I was, after I learned to, um, learned to make videos when I was 14, 15, uh, one of the earliest contracts that we got um, through Hello Cool World um, was with Chimamak, which is the um, Indigenous HIV division of the BC Centre for Disease Control. And we did this five-year project where we collaborated with communities across BC um, and worked with youth um, to tell their own stories. It was called uh, Star in Your Own Stories. And it was largely around HIV stigma, but it was um, very, very, the model was deeply, deeply influential into my own filmmaking. Um, and it was really guided by the Indigenous um, folks that we worked uh, in collaboration with. Um, and this sort of, you know, I, I talk about this when um, I give presentations around like the, if for the um, 501 course, for example, around research ethics, around how do we actually sort of, um, when people, when we interview someone for a research, research, how do we make it feel as if they've left with something, you know, not just monetary, monetary compensation, but how do we make them feel like they've arrived? And that type of like relational, um, on not just honoring of stories, but kind of building that sort of trust and reciprocity in my filmmaking was really driven from that experience. Um, working um, on that project. And so that's to the art aspect of how that practice has really shifted my way of thinking. And then, you know, kind of, I will also relate it to primary colors. Part of what we're trying to, what we're thinking about is, you know, there's the artist and what they produce, but there's so much more as a part, as all these facets of what an artist needs that um, doesn't really get valued. So part of what we're also looking at is like, how do we, how do we create a system or um, move towards a system where artists are funded to be artists? And that includes, you know, the simplest way I can put it is to be well-fed, <laughs> yeah, yeah. rested and not burnt out. Right. And, and when we only view the, artistic output that is transactional, all of that other work that artists need, and it's not just artists, you know, cultural workers and other types of work, um, it gets pushed to the side. And so, and this is sort of what I'm trying to also uh, figure out in my research too. How do I sort of, how can I look at an arts practice in its fullness and not just in the transactional thing that I can be traded and sold. Uh, I'm assuming that Love Intersections is the main place for people to come to. How can artists access Love Intersections? What can they, what can, what can they, how can they participate? You know, we've tried, it's, it, you know, I have, it, Love Intersections is very project-based and it really by project-based, I also mean that's how we how we have money to do these types of collaborations. Um, we haven't, we used to, but uh, you know, when, when we started, we really had no idea what, what we were going to do. We knew that, you know, we had a story, our story that we wanted to tell and do it in a good way. But we, and we also wanted to extend our lens, if I can use that metaphor to other, other communities. And so we did, we put out calls. Um, we got a lot, we got emails inquiring about, you know, how, how, folks could participate. Um, and that's how we made our first couple of videos. Over the past like eight years, we've really, Jen and I, so the other co-artistic director, have really built our own 
practice in terms of trying to inquire about different different layers of, of race. And part, we over the past three years, particularly around queer Asian identity. So that was with our film, Yellow Peril, Queer Destiny. And so it's kind of through those projects where we've been, um, you know, inviting others in. Value Co-op, though, um, does, uh, when we do have a wider scope, like people can apply to be a part of Value Co-op. And the only, not reservation or hesitation, is we at Value Co-op, I should mention that, you know, because we have a mandate to provide flexible living wage income, it also depends on our capacity as well to do that. So folks can definitely... Um, you know, I think on our website or get in touch with us to apply. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how we're slowly hoping to expand the, the co-op. So what's the question I'm not asking that I should be asking about love intersections? I don't know. You're, these are pretty good questions. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I worry, you know, that I'm asking more extractive questions and not reciprocating enough. And I don't want to miss, you know, the, the real story or, or what, you want people to take away from this conversation? That's a good question. (laughs) I mean, maybe sort of, um, maybe like sort of what we, what we're, what we hope, although I don't know what we hope to come out of love intersections. (laughs) Well, I think, I think, well, why don't we start with that? What do, what do we hope to come out of love intersections? Okay. So let's explore that. So in 2014, when the Vancouver School Board was updating their um, uh, anti-homophobia policies, um, they were doing a very routine update uh, to b- make the language more inclusive to trans and gender non-conforming folks. But it really touched the nerve of a particular group of people. And we're very careful to name this group of people, and you'll understand why in a moment, um, but particularly uh, the Chinese evangelical Christian community. And it's a community that I know very well because I grew up in in, in that community. And because of their protests, uh, the school board had to hold a whole bunch of community consultations. And Jen and I really struggled in this time for a number of reasons. One, one, um, the media was extremely racist. It was very quick to name, it, like literally there was a headline that said ethnic Chinese protest LGBT policies. Again, we started hearing racist stuff from our allies. So like, you know, things like why, what's wrong, what is wrong with Chinese culture that is so conservative? And we also just didn't feel our either of our stories represented in this controversy so from either side, from the media, um, from the people protesting who looked like my mother, who looked like my aunt. And so when we started Love Intersections, we had this idea of making an intervention on racism through telling our stories in a way in a way that we wanted um, it to be told. And then things started, you know, really, sh- I think we've shifted from there, though. You know, I think that is still something that we want to do. It's still something that's missing. Queer people of color stories are still um, needing to be told in a way that is also just not just not just the trauma stories. And we had a really good chat actually um, on Hot Pot Talks with Jules Kostachin, who is also a PhD, was also a PhD student in our institute, about how to hold that too, because um, you know, how do we how do we hold that trauma, which is important to hold, but also celebrate? How do we do both? And then also moving into like, you know, how do we make not just give people and you know, Don, you and I are in the Social Justice Institute identity politics are, you know, we're constantly, you know, immersed in identity politics. But more importantly, how do we get people to like feel differently? How do we get people to, you know, when I'm thinking about not just changing attitudes and giving people anti-oppression language, but how do we get them to feel um, and approach things differently, moving towards like a a decolonial or um, worldview? And so that's sort of what I'm thinking about in terms of what we might move towards for love intersections is how can how can this work? Yeah, shift um, ideas, behaviors, um, and feelings as well. Yeah, great questions. Yeah, <laughs> easy ones. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. They're they're the big questions of the day. How do we yeah. how, do, how do we change the way we view the world? How do we change our thoughts? And yeah. It's, yeah, you mentioned hot pot talks. Can you share more? Yeah, so that happened at the, so the exhibit that I mentioned before with the Limb Association, that has been canceled three times. So the (laughs) first, the first because of COVID. So the first time it got canceled, um, Hot Pot Talks grew out of um, a desire to have those conversations about Chinatowns, about what I mentioned before, about histories of segregation, diaspora, but also like pushing sort of, um, I think we were also really intentional about um, 
crossing over some of those categories as well. And so we'll have philosophers, we'll have chefs, we'll have cooks, we'll have activists um, and other artists come and have conversations broadly, loosely related to um, the topics I mentioned before. Um, and it kind of, it's just kind of grown in a really nice way. Um, there was a producer from TELUS who watched the finale in season one and they funded season two um, and now we're in season three. So it's been a nice way to sort of continue um, conversations virtually, like what you're doing. That's a really nice compliment for your work. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, because, yeah, it is. It, it's been nice um, to be able to, it's been a new type, I have to say, it's been a new uh, learning too, because I think interviewing for documentary, very different from this. I have so much respect for this kind of stuff that you do because <laughs> having this type having conversation and interviewing is quite different I find anyway and yeah so it's been a it's also been a really nice learning so what have you learned uh what what has struck you about the conversations we have well first just like even um even just mechanically <laughs> like in when I in documentary I'm I, I, you, no interrupting, right? No interjecting, almost like you have to, you are waiting for the person to finish their fully, fully finish their thoughts so that I have something easy to edit to in, in the edit suite, right? <laughs> whereas, whereas in, because otherwise, you know, it just, it's, it's just a hot mess. But in, I find in hot pot talks anyways, like there's also a level of like me needing to also share as well. And that sort of thinking on, on our feet was it's just a different way that I've been preparing and 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 learning as well, and so trying to be trying to also um, give as much as I am receiving, and so that there's like a you know there's a, a nice balanced conversation, um, just a different way of of thinking. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I know the answer to this, but can you speak to reciprocity and what happens when that exists in a conversation? Yeah, well, I, so I, I and I learned this from my friend Jada, and she who who summed it up very nicely a couple, I think it was a, in a conversation not too long ago, um, and it, it's kind of like what I mentioned before, but it's kind of like when you're sort of um, also sharing, and it's especially with people who are also you may not know very well, so it's this sort of like building of trust, especially when there's like you know stories of trauma that come up, for example. I, and it's still, I will say, it's still sort of a, something that I'm working on. But how do you, how do I sort of respond in a way that's not just like, I've just taken that trauma from someone, for example, or taken that story? And how do I sort of, um, and I think, um, and from what I'm trying to learn is that responding and also sharing in a way that makes the person feel like I've received the story, but I'm also like, you know, honoring it um, yeah, in a yeah. good, in a good way. It's a trick. I don't. I don't. And I have to say, I don't fully have the answer to the steps on how to do that. Um, but it's that sort of delicate, um, thoughtful process, I guess. You know, it's funny. I'm reminded that our best conversations are those where the ability to listen and to ask generous questions brings out the best in those asking, as well as those answering. Certainly a different objective from a journalist looking for a factual statement or a soundbite. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it's, it, it, it can feel, um, and it, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm often very, very suspicious of journalists, largely because of my experiences with the, what, the love intersection story, but also because, you know, I had an, I had an experience where I, when I was in high school, this was my, this is where I learned, I, became an activist actually, was we were a part of like a youth um, group who was trying to advocate for um, sexual health ed education. And so we got a call from a journalist who said they were interested in our work and they interviewed me, but the article was about a syphilis outbreak in, in North Vancouver. That's crazy. I'm almost speechless. Yeah. And, and from that moment, I, 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 I was, have been very, very, very like, you know, how are my words being going to be manipulated? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you it were, was, you yeah, were yeah. wary and, and, not, and not trusting. Yeah. So I'm going to take a chance and ask, how do you navigate difficult conversations? I'm just trying to think of an, ex uh, an example because I, there we have lots of difficult conversations. I'm thinking, you know, one that has come up um, recently and often is um, so like I'm thinking like w within. Um, so I, I've mentioned the the anti-racist work that we've yeah. been doing, 
um, but also trying to think about intercultural solidarity. And, um, you know, talking through um, Asia,